Hello everyone and welcome to this third day of the 2021 Australian BioCommons Showcase. My name's Nigel Ward, I'm Associate Director for Platforms with the Australian, within the Australian BioCommons and I'll be running the session for the next 50 minutes or so. Uh, we're going to have a bit of a change of pace. Uh, yesterday we talked, one of the sessions covered the use of Galaxy Australia to provide graphical user interfaces to tools and workflows so folks could assemble reference genomes. The slight change of pace today is we're going to look at um, tools and workflows that are instead deployed to being deployed to Australia's high performance computer systems and accessed by command lines. Uh, before I introduce the speakers, I'd like to acknowledge the country from which I'm speaking today. So I acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. For me in Ninjin, Brisbane, that's the Yagara and Turbal people. I pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue, continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And I recognize the valuable contributions to Australia and global, global society. Here are the speakers for today's session. Uh, first of all, we'll, all we'll, off we'll be hearing from Rosemary Sadser from the Sydney Informatics Hub. We'll be giving an overview of some of the Australian BioCommons activity in, uh, in developing command line workflows and tools. Following Rosemary, Georgie, also from Sydney Informatics Hub, will be talking about her experiences building best practice pipelines for bioinformaticians and some of the outcomes, biological outcomes from running those pipelines. Following that, Tracy Chu, also from Sydney Informatics Hub, will be talking about some of the challenges that the team has had in deploying uh, those pipelines to high performance computers, but also the successes in doing so. Then we'll hear from Dale, Dale Roberts, just to flip it around a bit, uh, from the National Computing Infrastructure, talk about why high performance computing facilities finding it difficult to run bioinformatics software, some of the challenges they face, and the efforts that NCI is taking to respond to those challenges. And finally, Johan will wrap, Johan Gustafsson from uh, BioCommons will wrap up the session, talking about how to make the various command line tools and workflows we're hearing about today, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. At the end, we'll have, we will have time for discussion. Please put any questions you have in the quick Q&A panel in Zoom, and we'll try and get to some of them during the session, and ones we, that we don't, we'll get to at the end. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Rosemary. Thanks, Nigel. Uh, good afternoon, every, afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Rosemary Sadsad, the Informatics Manager at the Sydney Informatics Hub, a partner of the ARDC Platforms Project, um, Bring Your Own Data uh, CLI platform. And I'll be providing an overview of some of the activities in this project. Next slide, please. Um, this project is delivered collaboratively by many partners, including the ODC, Bioplatforms Australia, AAF, Arnet, Melbourne Bioinformatics, NCI, Causey, QCIF, and the Sydney Informatics Hub. Uh, with each partner, as Rhys mentioned yesterday, bringing their leadership and technical strengths uh, to this project and have been, a delight, have, been a, have been delightful to work with. Um, this is a platform to enable the community creation, access, exchange, of workflows, tools, reference data, training, and user support across national and institutional compute infrastructure with that focus on command line based services. A command line platform offers transparency with analyses, allowing researchers to see what's going on under the hood and providing flexibility to adapt analyses and computing resources to the needs of their project and data. Next slide, please. Uh, the CLI platform create, uh, caters to researchers of varying bioinformatics skills, um, research domains, and offers scalability for large projects. A key capability for this platform is enabling the development and adaptation of bioinformatics workflows and tools to quickly trial different software and fine tune settings and parameters to the research problem. Next slide, please. The platform offers workflows and tools that have been tried and tested by researchers on different compute infrastructures and with the flexibility to adapt, add and share these. The platform is built in a coordinated manner on distributed infrastructure such as Pawsey and Perker and CI and Canberra and under the hood uses cutting edge technology that also improves the user experience. 
These include providing bioinformatics pipelines in standard workflow languages like Nextflow, providing interactive Jupyter or RStudio notebooks or orchestrators like Nextflow Tower to easily launch workflows, um, a CERN VM file system that can expose the central reference data sets in Galaxy to, for example, cloud and HPC facilities in Pausy, and containerized software that supports portability and, and accessibility, uh, but can add complexity with container specific syntax. We have services or introducing services such as Singularity HPC, which lets researchers use containers as they would with native software. We're developing a coordinated support model to use these services, which includes working with a biocommons training program, having fair knowledge bases and regist registries to find and contribute workflows and tools and user guides and support. Next slide, please. In line with Sarah's talk yesterday, we aim to enable an experience that is simpler, flexible and consistent across the, different, the, the distributed services. The researcher would bring their own data with an analysis or data processing in mind, and depending on their skill level, level and problem, can choose how and where they want to run their analyses. For example, a researcher wants to perform a variant, variant calling on a handful of samples. They would use work, the workflow finder service to find a variant calling pipeline, but need to change the reference genome for their organism. So choose the interactive notebook version of the pipeline to make these changes add the pre-indexed reference genome from the central reference data repository, and then launch the pipeline on um, national cloud that they would have access to. This is a theoretical example of the use of the platform. I'll now pass on to Dr. Georgie Samaha, who will share stories of researchers who are interacting with the platform in real life. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rosie. So yeah, I'm a bioinformatician from the Sydney Informatics Hub, and I'm just going to talk about some of the ways uh, we've helped researchers to scale up their research using high performance computing, um, and how we've used uh, some of the researcher led projects that we've worked on to build a range of resources um, for the broader Australian bioinformatics community. Uh, next slide, please. So Sydney Informatics Hub is a, a core research facility at the University of Sydney um, and the bioinformatics team um, at SIH provide uh, researchers with research computing and da data analytics expertise, um, as well as training and access to computational resources. And because of the growing affordability um, of next generation sequencing technologies that we often talk about uh, in this space, we're um, increasingly approached by researchers who want to apply these technologies um, at scale. Um, and so we've worked closely with researchers across a range of different disciplines, and we hear a common uh, story from many of them. Um, so, you know, they're generating large uh, data sets. So we're on the upper scale, the upper end of the terabyte scale. They're performing analyses that are computationally um, demanding. And as such, they've outgrown the resources that are offered by the university's HPC. Um, so they come to us for support. Uh, in finding and accessing the compute resources that they need, um, as well as building and running uh, fast and efficient uh, best practice pipelines that are user friendly. The next slide, please. So to address some of these shared challenges, we've been de um, developing and deploying um, efficient and reproducible pipelines for national HPCs. And I've just listed some of the recent work we've done here um, with researchers at Sydney University, just to give you a sense of how broadly felt these challenges are and you know, what kind of impact um, reproducible pipelines have had across a range of research disciplines. Um, you know, all these projects have pretty large data sets and they've also involved um, very complex bioinformatic analyses. So that's included things like genome alignments, uh, variant calling and de novo transcriptome assembly. And despite you know, the variety and, um, of organisms and research questions that you can see here, you know, all these projects face the same challenges computationally. They all needed uh, large amounts of disk space, high levels of RAM and long wall times that the university's HPC couldn't deliver, but national uh, platforms could. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, so in developing you know, various uh, scalable and reusable pipelines in close collaboration with researchers and the national compute facilities, um, you know, we've, we've been able to support, uh, to offer really important support to um, researchers. Firstly, um, by specifically optimizing the pipelines that we've been developing for uh, the infrastructures, we've reduced the amount of time and the computational expertise that's needed to run them. Um, and secondly, because they demonstrate uh, efficient use of compute infrastructures, uh, these pipelines have successfully been used by researchers in applications for competitive computational uh, merit allocation schemes. And we're starting to see them cited in high impact publications as well. 
And they've also actually been a really important part of the work we've been doing um, with Biocommons and with our Biocommons partners at the community level. And I'm gonna quickly talk through uh, some of the achievements that have come from a particular whole genome sequencing project for both the researcher that we worked with um, and also the broader community. Can you go to the next slide, please. So this is, uh, we've been working closely with Vanessa Hayes' group recently. Uh, her group looks at variation in human genome um, in order to understand how our ancestral past informs fitness um, and health in modern human populations. And they're particularly interested in global health disparities in prostate cancer. And so they approached uh, the Sydney Informatics Hub with the task of uh, processing 380 human whole genome samples. Uh, they needed to be able to align these samples to the reference genome, um, and also perform germline, somatic, and structural variant calling in order to profile the ancestral and mutational factors that might be driving um, the ethnic and geographic health disparities in prostate cancer that we see globally. So we identified NCI as a suitable infrastructure for their work, um, and this was because of the size of their data set and the kind of the analyses that they were running. We built an optimized best practice mapping and variant calling pipelines collaboratively with compute specialists at NCI. And we also use these um, optimized pipelines to successfully support uh, institutional and national merit scheme uh, uh, applications and publications for her group. So her group was successfully able to deploy these pipelines independently because we built comprehensive documentation alongside the pipelines um, that included detailed user guides and compute resource guides. Um, as well as benchmarking examples for how these pipelines performed on real data. And following the success of this project, Vanessa and her group are actually looking to scale these pipelines up to 500 samples next year. Uh, but also beyond the direct impact this work had on research outcomes for her group, it's been deployed, these pipelines have been deployed by other researchers. Um, so this has included other cancer research groups, canine genetics um, and wildlife conservation groups as well. And they've also been used successfully by these groups uh, for their own successful merit scheme applications. Next slide, thanks. So one of the most impactful outcomes of the work has been the reduction in time it takes to process big batches of samples. Um, and you know we're talking about hundreds of samples at a time here. Um, and working closely with NCI staff and through a comprehensive benchmarking process, we managed to efficiently reduce the runtime of aligning raw sequence reads to a reference genome um, and calling germline variants um, from days to about seven hours. Uh, next slide, please. And while of course, like, you know, the, uh, the uh, efficiency has been a really important outcome, we've also managed to confirm that our pipelines deliver biological accuracy and consistency. You know, so while whole genome sequencing has become, you know, very quite ubiquitous in biomedical research, it's also starting to be used in translational applications. So ensuring the computational pipelines used for these studies are producing valid results is really critical. And we know that implementations of these tools can affect their, affect their accuracy. So we've recently performed a quality assurance study um, using publicly available gold standard data sets, and we found them to be consistent with other best practice implementations of these tools. And when we're looking at accuracy, we're interested in things like the absence of um, false positive signals and the ability to detect variants that are known to be present in the genome, um, and also any biases in the implementation that might result in erroneous calls. And so while we've used this exercise to demonstrate the accuracy of our pipelines, it's also given us the opportunity to share the knowledge and skills that we've gained through this process with the broader community. And we're currently in the process of uh, developing a benchmarking guide for anyone who's building their own variant calling pipelines and would like to evaluate the accuracy themselves. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so you can see from, uh, you know, working closely with researchers as well as uh, compute infrastructure staff, we've created a number of resources for the Australian bioinformatics community. You know, firstly, one thing, one of the things we've addressed is, um, you know, one of the most challenging things researchers face is gaining access to national HPCs. And it can be really especially challenging for first time applicants, especially those who don't have much bioinformatics or HPC experience. And this is because these schemes require researchers to demonstrate that they understand how the infrastructure works and they're going to use it efficiently. Um, you know, which that requires a specific school uh, tool set that many biologists don't have. Uh, and so while we offer direct support to Sydney University researchers, we've also been developing uh, publicly available guides and webinars in collaboration with the Biocommons and our Biocommons partners um, that help researchers understand uh, what national HPCs are available to them, how they can access them, and how they can also put together compelling and successful merit scheme applications. 
Uh, all our pipelines are public, uh, findable and citable. Um, you can find them on the Biocommons Workflow Finder, and they're also registered on Workflow Hub and GitHub as well. And we prioritize making them easy to use and reuse on many different data sets, um, including non-model species that might have different ideas of what best practice workflow might involve. So, you know, researchers who work with non-human organisms can choose their own journey with the help of the comprehensive use, user guide and resource guides that we've created. Um, and we've also worked with NCI to ensure that uh, researchers don't have to deal with the headaches that come from installing their own tools by making sure uh, that all the tools that our pipelines run are globally installed on the infrastructure. Um, and we're also working constantly to improve them. Uh, we work really closely with researchers to test our scripts and our documentation and resolve you know, any bugs um, that might be present and ensure that our documentation is actually useful um, and can even be run by novice users. And so by doing these things, you know, we've been able to deliver direct support to researchers who are producing really high impact research, but we've also managed to create some resources that help researchers to help themselves and improve the bioinformatic and compute literacy uh, of life scientists um, through understanding, you know, how compute facilities work, particularly HPCs, um, how to use them responsibly and efficiently, um, and how making these things accessible for researchers um, at all levels of expertise with bioinformatics. That's it for me, thank you. Hey everyone, um, so I'll be talking next. Uh, my name is Tracy and I'm also from the Sydney Informatics Hub. And I'll be going into more depth, I guess, and talking about the challenges and successes with deploying bioinformatics workflows to high performance computing systems. Um, and in particular, I'd like to share our most challenging experiences, which was with building scalable bioinformatics workflows. Next slide, please, Nigel. Uh, so you just heard from Georgie, our experiences, especially working with the University of Sydney researchers and their need to scale bioinformatics workflows. But you don't have to look very far to recognize that this is quite commonplace. There are published surveys and reports of actual disconsumption of public data sets and projections into the future, which all point towards huge data growth in the life sciences field. So the figure on the bottom left um, is a figure that represents data accumulation over time housed at the European Bioinformatics Institute. And this is a public repository that stores data submitted by users for a range of omics types. And you can see that there is a consistent growth for each database and each are reaching the 100 petabyte mark. Similarly, on the right-hand side, you can see this growth for DNA sequencing data housed at NCBI, another public repository over time. Um, and at the time of publication in 2015, uh, this group reported that the database included 32,000 microbial, 5,000 plant and animal, and 250,000 human genomes. And it's quite mind blowing to think what it might be now, especially working with different research groups, already working with hundreds of genomes themselves. Um, and interestingly, coming from a researcher's perspective, the paper at the top surveyed National Science Foundation principal investigators, so those mainly based in the US and Canada, and found that 90% of researchers were increasing the scale of their analyses specifically for HPC. So in other words, there were more individual groups and projects wanting to perform uh, analyses at scale. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so while that's all well and good, at the start of the project, we wanted to know what the landscape was like for Australian life science researchers and what their specific challenges were. For instance, what sorts of compute facilities did the typical Australian researcher have access to, whether it be cloud, HPC or GUI? Was this sufficient for their needs and scale of, a, of analyses? Were there publicly available desired workflows deployable on the systems that they had access to? Uh, what sorts of data sets or omics technologies were they working with? And what sorts of skills were required to conduct their analyses? Uh, next slide, please. Because we wanted to know the challenges faced by large scale users specifically, we were particularly interested in the types of workflows and tools used by national HPC facilities, uh, facility users. So that includes the National Compute Infrastructure, PAUSI, and the University of Queensland's flashlight systems. 
We looked at projects that were awarded an allocation through the National Compute Merit Allocation Scheme between 2018 and 2021, or through those who accessed uh, these facilities through their local merit allocation schemes. And overall, we captured uh, users that covered 16 institutions across Australia. And we also directly engaged with many of these researchers to hear what their experiences were with using these facilities and to hear about what their current research was about. And from this, we could see that uh, specific tools and workflows um, that were commonly being applied, uh, which you can see on this word cloud on the slide here, um, we saw many whole genome sequencing projects applying tools included in the Broad's best practices pipeline. So that includes tools like BWA and GATK and many annotation and assembly type projects, which include tools like Trinity and BLAST. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, after this exercise and talking to our national compute facility partners within the Biocommons and also Rosemary, who are much more familiar with non-bioinformatics tools and workflows. We recognize that bioinformatics users who don't use, uh, most bioinformatics users don't use HPC in the way it's traditionally used. So traditionally HPC is used for jobs with smaller input data, where data is kept in memory during the job. And there are many computations being performed per data element. And the limits here tend to be related to compute or network capacity which is actually okay for these users because this is exactly what the national HPC facilities are designed to cater for. Unlike the other domains, however, um, bioinformatics workflows tend to be quite complex with multiple tools and stages within each workflow. And each of the tools can also fall under um, other three types of compute, which include data intensive jobs. So that's where compute time is largely spent handling large amounts of data, so your typical whole genome sequencing project. Um, compute can be input or output intensive, so that's where compute is having to handle millions to tiny, uh, millions to billions of tiny little files, which are generally not liked by HPC file systems and need to be handled well. And most assembly jobs are characteristic of this. And lastly, uh, there are memory intensive jobs, which assembly and whole genome sequencing projects tend to be. Um, because of these characteristics, a typical bioinformatician would have to benchmark each tool in their workflow and optimize these for national HPC just to apply to have access to these systems, which many users don't have the time or expertise for. I remember doing this within our team for the first time for one application with at least 25 different tools for a whole genome sequencing cancer project. And I think from memory, the application ended up being almost 80 pages. And I actually thought this was quite normal. And I was quite shocked to see when I saw um, the sample application released by the committee, which was only 10 pages long, including references. Um, and included only five tools which were actually made to work well with HPC. Um, because of this mismatch, national facilities also don't expect bioinformatics workflows um, and the usage paradigms that they enforce, such as shorter wall times, uh, preference for running multiple node jobs, just don't fit what available bioinformatics tools and workflows uh, actually use and require. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in order to enable Australian researchers to use national facilities and perform scalable bioinformatics analyses, we knew we had to build and re-engineer these commonly used pipelines for these national HPC facilities. However, some of the nice things that a user would want in a pipeline, such as portability and easy deployment, was just not possible because they didn't meet facility usage paradigms. So things like um, being able to use containers. Optimizing workflows to be efficient and scalable was often hardware and input data dependent. So for example, running a workflow for a human data set would often yield different efficiencies um, if you ran the exact same workflows on a Tasmanian double data set. Also, one of the challenges that we are still addressing today 
um, is the question of who would provide ongoing support and maintenance when there are so many pipelines and new pipelines being built in a constantly changing field. Uh, next slide, please. So although we faced many of these challenges, uh, we came up with a variety of solutions that addressed performing scalable analyses and how to improve access to national HPC facilities, uh, which you've already heard from Georgie a little bit. So we worked closely with our national facility partners to build and optimize these bioinformatics workflows for their systems. And um, you'll hear even more about this in the next talk from Dale from the National Computer Infrastructure. Um, and we also worked closely with them to come up with advice for how a typical bioinformatician could apply for access to these schemes. Um, and I think this was also really helpful for them to know what was common practice in the bioinformatics field. We've passed this on to users uh, through resources we've built, such as our sample NCMAS application, training that's available on YouTube on how to benchmark, optimize, and apply for schemes and ensuring that user guides are informative and structured in a way that might makes pipelines as accessible as possible. And we're also looking to further improve these pipelines through the resources and services that our partners are building, particularly with easy tool deployment and having reference data sets already available on national HPC facilities. Next slide, please. Um, so with our partners, uh, we now have over 14 registered workflows using the three national HPC facilities. Um, and as Georgie has shared, we're already starting to see some publications and good outcomes um, using these workflows. Uh, so that's it from me. Thank you. So um, I'm Dale Roberts. Um, I'm a member of the HPC team at NCI. Uh, now, my focus in that team is primarily on the application software environment on Guardi, our peak HPC system, and making sure that uh, this environment can cater effectively to the needs of our, as many of our 5,000 or so users as possible. Um, I'll start by saying I've really only been tangentially involved in onboarding the genomics community onto Guardi. The credit for the hard work done in this area on assisting with workflow porting and optimization needs to go to many people across NCI of at least four different teams. Um, those that immediately come to mind are listed here, but uh, I'm sure I'm missing people. So I'm gonna start by talking about some of the challenges that have been encountered when genomics pipelines have been ported onto Guardi, sort of a bit of a deeper dive into what Tracy has already mentioned. And then I'll talk a bit about the challenges we've encountered when it comes to supporting the software needs of uh, genomics projects on Guardi. So um, in my experience, uh, genomics applications and pipelines tend to suffer from being developed in a desktop or a local cluster environment first, and then brought to HPC later. Uh, the common pressure points for scaling up these desktop style applications tend to be, broadly speaking, bio patterns and perhaps process and thread allocation. So if we go to the next slide, um, I'll start with IO performance. Um, specifically, the, the uh, open seek, small read, close patterns that are characteristic of a lot of genomic software. We've got a sort of visual re representation of this on the slide. Um, this hypothetical application is reading small chunks of data a couple of thousand times a second and is working on compute the rest of the time. So on the surface, this seems fairly efficient. These IO operations are fast and the compute take up the majority of the runtime. And these patterns work just fine on modern desktops with solid state drives, but they can cause headaches on HPC. So the fastest storage on Guardi can handle about a million IO operations every second before the whole file system and therefore the entire HPC system starts becoming unresponsive. These IO operations are kind of like a resource that has to be shared between a couple of thousand running jobs and whatever anyone else is doing on the login and uh, data mover nodes in that moment in time. So for, for some perspective, a million IO operations a second is about the same performance as a high-end um, desktop solid state drive. Um, I mean, this doesn't sound impressive. God is a supercomputer, it should be faster, but um, Guardi's file systems consist of thousands of individual hard drives, uh, each being served for you know, each, uh, thousands of individual drives being served from hundreds of servers. And something like a simple open operation requires data being exchanged from a minimum of three servers before that operation can complete. So given the complexity involved, a million operations a second isn't too bad. Uh, the trouble comes from scaling up applications like this one. If you've got an application like this running through a parallel workflow manager, um, on every core, on just two nodes of Guardi, this workflow alone 
has just about reached that, malleum, that magic uh, 1 million IO operations per second number. It's entirely possible for a workflow that has been designed with the assumption of running on solid state drives to choke these global file systems. And workflows like this especially suffer from other users. Uh, if there is some other workflow running uh, that is pulling data from the same underlying drive or sets of drives that this workflow's data is on, all of those little read operations need to wait in a queue behind whatever else is happening and the workflow slows down pretty drastically. Well, so our response to this comes down to seeing, essentially observing the behavior of these workflows and figuring out where they would fit best on our systems. So in this instance, this hypothetical workflow can have its data moved off of global storage and onto job local storage, which is no longer shared and utilizes solid state drives, which gives you better small IO performance. You can stage the input data in at the start of the job and stage it out at the end. Uh, next slide, thanks. So on an HPC system, bursty workflows can also be a problem. And by bursty, I mean something that consumes a variable amount of CPU resources as it progresses. Uh, sometimes this workflow or application will leave a machine mostly idle, and other times it will attempt to utilize as many CPUs as possible in a race to idle style compute model. I've, I've tried to sort of draw that up here. Um, our simplified definition of using utilizing Guardi effectively is that every CPU core should have one compute intensive process running on it. Unfortunately, some application behavior that we're seeing more and more often is software trying to be clever. It's trying to figure out how many cores it has access to, and often it picks a far too high number due to various hardware quirks I won't go into. On a desktop or a departmental cluster, this is fine. The program can launch too many threads and it, um, program can quite happily launch too many threads and it'll get away with it because the OS can schedule these threads efficiently and um, anything, they'll eventually complete. Uh, this kind of falls apart on HPC though. Uh, these clever applications tend to be launched by a workflow manager that has been instructed to run 48 tasks on a Guardi node in parallel. This is the number of, C number of CPU cores on a Guardi node. And you see where this is going. We've now got uh, say 96 thread, 96 uh, by 48 threads fighting over 48 physical cores. There is a huge cost in performance that comes from these threads fighting each other to occupy CPU cores. We get to occupy these cores for a fraction of a second to get a tiny bit of work done before they're uh, suspended by the OS for a moment so that the next thread can get through. Uh, no operating system can, is particularly good at figuring out what to do when nearly 5,000 threads are asking for compute and memory resources all at once. Um, our response to this is to take our expertise with more traditional parallel computing paradigms and apply, it, apply this to the software run by your workflows. We know what to look for in terms of processes and thread launchings and bindings and things like that. And we can, we can do our best to advise on settings to apply in order to try and keep the workflows running as close to that definition of efficiency as possible. Our overarching goal is to enable as much science on our facilities as possible. So when we see behavior like what we've just described, it's important for us to understand your workflows and to see what we can do to enable them to run as efficiently as possible, because this is in everyone's best interest. We work together to figure out how to make your workflows fit on our system and how to make our system a better fit for your workflow. Uh, we have done this. We have made um, behind the scenes change to OS settings and things like that in response to some of this behavior. So really what we want is your jobs to finish faster, which means the next researcher's job will start sooner and which means more science gets done. Uh, next slide, thanks. So another challenge we've encountered with uh, genomic software support um, with several genomics groups converging onto NCI HPC facilities, we're finding more and more overlap between the tools that each group uses. Uh, even though there's a lot of similarity between the tools used between groups, each group is pretty much left to their own devices in terms of software support. This um, historically is, is by design. Traditional HPC software management used to rely on each project bringing in-house software, while the facility itself provided a small selection of software centrally uh, that had some demand established for it. The software would typically be things like uh, compilers or message passing interface libraries, data format libraries, math libraries, things like that. Of course, you know, uh, modern software development doesn't work like this. Scientific software is trending to be larger and more complex applications, larger and more complex pipelines with developments shared across many research groups and users shared across even more. We've obviously had to adapt to this as best we can. And now historically NCI has addressed this by supporting more and more software centrally. Generally, we've done this by hiring domain experts or encouraging staff to skill up 
effect in areas of expertise. Still, though, there wasn't really a middle ground between fully central support for software and, in, and individual projects having their own software installations. We now have uh, over 500 centrally supported software installations in Slash Apps. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to diverge for a bit and talk about our process for supporting software on Guardi. Uh, now, when we make the decision to support a piece of software on Guardi, it's not taken lightly. Support to us means that whoever is assigned to install this application must be confident that they can resolve any problems the user might encounter with it. They have to be confident that they can resolve any build issues or any issues of incompatibility between that software and Guardi itself. They have to be confident that the application will be used widely enough such that it's worth the staff time put in to enable this level of support. Somewhere between a third and a half of all software installed into Slash Apps on Guardi has some kind of customization or patching put in place by NCI staff. Sometimes it's fairly simple things like changing a Python interpreter line. Some often it's much more involved and requires us to dive deep into source code and report issues to developers and create our own patches. There's a lot of domain expert that goes into managing software on Guardi. And so our solution for keeping this consistent and reproducible has been an in-house automation procedure. We essentially have a repository of build scripts written by NCI staff hosted on a GitLab instance and some custom software that runs these scripts in a special environment where a merge request is made. Another staff member will review the build and when it finishes, make sure it's all good. And then the final installation will be completed when the merge request is accepted. We've essentially applied uh, software development lifecycle principles to uh, software installation. So the software that performs these builds also stores data about the builds. Um, things like what script was run, when it was run, what modules it loaded, what modules it created. It has to, in order to be able to do this reproducibly, but it's like it have the ability to supply this data via a web API, API to things like Johan's um, tool finder service. Uh, next slide, thanks. Not much more. So what we're doing with the genomics community is levering, leveraging domain expertise with bioinformatics software and able specific uh, shared software space on Guardi's for software installations, as well as a script repository frees incoming genomics groups from needing to manage all of their own software, which gets them up and running and getting results faster. By synchronizing our install script uh, standards, NCI can quickly port these installations across to the main Guardian install script repository, essentially skipping the established demand and write the script part of the installation workflow and going straight, uh, straight into Slash Apps. This helps with ongoing support. If there's a problem with a centrally installed package that has been incorporated into Slash Apps from the Ables repository, we know who we might be able to contact for assistance if we run out of ideas. Uh, in future, we're looking to create an Able specific custom build management software that can hook into Tool Finder, allowing researchers to see which software is supported through Able's software project on Guardi and which is supported centrally through Slash Apps. Uh, I'm done, thanks. Thanks, thanks, Dale. Um, slight change of pace. We've heard a lot about deploying uh, workflows. Now we're here about finding them, making them accessible. Over to you, Johan. Thanks, Nigel. I wanted to start this session um, by talking about our wonderfully complex community. Um, as we highlighted in the community engagement session on Wednesday, the overall community is composed of multiple overlapping researcher communities of practice, data production and compute infrastructures, as well as consortia that are also heavily interconnected. Hence the complexity. Next slide, please. These communities either make use of or produce a number of bioinformatics artifacts, um, including tools, workflows, compute systems, um, and benchmarking information for tools and workflows um, that have been run on these systems. The complexity of the community means that the sum of all these bioinformatics activities is equally complex. And because of the sheer number of researchers and projects involved, this ecosystem is virtually opaque to all but a few. Next slide, please. If this ecosystem was fair, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, it would also be tangible. You could get a real sense of what is out there, where it's available, and how it can be reused. In a sentence, wouldn't it be great if you could have some insight into the breadth and depth of activity in bioinformatics? I like to also think of the fair tools and workflows concept as a bridge between bioinformaticians at the bleeding edge and the researchers who would like to reuse their products. If they know the tools and workflows are there and that Australian infrastructure can mediate reuse, duplication of effort can be reduced, best practice approaches can be made more visible, we can continue to foster reuse and collaboration. 
researchers can accelerate the progress of their research projects and their associated outcomes. And ultimately, you, the community, can do more research. The two mechanisms we employ for making tool and workflow information fair are the tool finder and workflow finder services. Next slide, please. Here on this slide, I'm gonna give an insight into these services. First and foremost, each one draws on community engagements, including community practice roadmaps and direct engagements. This is why I've included the uh, community wheel here in the middle. The community is foundational to both services. The next step is to collaboratively converge on existing global registries to support the curation of tool and workflow lists that are of interest to Australian researchers, maintain a standardized set of metadata for these tools and workflows, and ultimately reduce cur curation burden uh, by empowering our researchers and helping to leverage and contribute to the efforts of the global community. Next slide, please. Uh, the next step is we aggregate this information. We merge our curated lists with global registry metadata and information sourced directly from our infrastructure partners. For Toolfinder, this infrastructure information covers software versions installed. For Workflow Finder, all information, including deployment locations, is contributed directly to Workflow Hub by our partners. Finally, this integrated information is deployed publicly uh, via a web page. Next slide, please. So this is Toolfinder. Toolfinder lists bioinformatics tools of interest to the Australian life sciences community. Uh, and as I said earlier, it merges this list with standardized tool metadata that includes links to global registries, licenses and categorizations provided via the EDEM ontology, but also the specific versions installed centrally on Biocommons partner compute infrastructures. I've provided the URL to the service here. Please do have a look. We always appreciate feedback and would love to hear your comments and suggestions. Next slide, please. And this is Workflow Finder. In its current form, this service draws directly on the Global Registry Workflow Hub, where the, where the Biocommons and its partner infrastructures maintain a space for best practice workflows that are deployable on Australian national infrastructure. Now, there are four important points here. The first one is that this includes example workflows that have been mentioned during this showcase. Um, as you've heard earlier in this session, these workflows are tested, use case driven, best practice and reusable. Uh, after only a few months, uh, the workflows have been viewed thousands of times. And finally, you can join the effort. Anyone can create a team and begin registering and citing workflows. If you're interested, please do visit Workflow Hub or you can get in contact with us directly. Next slide, please. Both services shown are uh, under active development, including a focus on user experience and making the services as fit for purpose as possible. Our vision is of a service where workflows can be discovered in a more intuitive way and then be seamlessly deployed to suitable Australian computational infrastructures. An example of this is the process already available internationally for Galaxy workflows. And given the possibilities that Galaxy unlocks for researchers, it will be transformational to provide this option to the Australian life science community. So imagine deploying a Galaxy workflow at the push of a button. Next slide, please. I wanted to finish by highlighting that this is a truly global effort and draws on collaborations across the Australian communities and compute infrastructures, as well as our international peer infrastructures, which includes Elixir Bio.Tools and Workflow Hub. As Rhys pointed out yesterday, it's our partnerships that make the Biocommons possible. And like many other outcomes, making Australian bioinformatics fair simply isn't possible without these partnerships. Thank you. Thanks, Johan, and thanks everyone. Um, we're actually finished ahead of time, so we have got quite a bit of time for questions. While people think of questions, I'd just like to thank the, all of the presenters, Rosemary, Georgie, and Tracy from the Sydney Informatics Hub, Dale from the National Computing Computational Infrastructure, and Johan from the Australian BioCommons. Tracy, you raised a 
one of the challenges is that the project and the collaboration is thinking about, which is around um, maintenance and ongoing support for these, these tools and workflows once they're deployed. Um, I wonder if the panelists had any thoughts on, on what those what the challenges are and how we might solve them. Do you want my input first? Why not? <laughs> Um, I've actually been talking to Johan about this and yes, it's such a challenging thing to address. Um, we're already quite overwhelmed. I wouldn't say overwhelmed. We're overjoyed that we are getting many users um, using our pipelines that we've built, but it does um, come with a lot of burden for maintaining and supporting these pipelines, um, not just fixing bugs, but um, having users request certain features be added onto these pipelines. Um, and I think this whole experience really, um, you know, gets us to consider what we really support next. Um, we really want to encourage a communi community based um, maintenance model, I suppose. So there are already available workflows out there. Um, but we do understand that for whatever reason it may be, whether it be that the available pipelines don't operate well on national compute facilities, um, that they just don't exist. So I think, yeah, it's just something really challenging. I'm not exactly sure how we're going to go about it, but those are my general thoughts. Thanks, Tracy. Um, Rosemary, you're talking to you. you. You've you've told me that one of the challenges is when these pipelines are delivered, developed collaboratively between an informatics groups such as yours and a HPC group such as NCI. Uh, where does responsibility lie? Is that is that accurate? Yeah, that's right. It is uh, tricky. I know um, it's probably um, not intuitive that you would think, oh, we've got so many people working on it. There's more load to share. But um, we're each contributing our strengths, I guess, when we um, build these pipelines. So you end up being um, responsible for that particular contribution. And uh, when we, we are trying to see how um, the support and maintenance falls into the current existing support models for each of the facilities and uh, research support services. So if you have um, NCI user support, is there when we develop something together, um, and I guess you have a good relationship together, if, um, can do we know what type of problems would go to NCI user support or would it go to um, a bioinformatics uh, research support group? Um, I think there might be a little bit of bouncing around between the groups if we don't know where it would land, but um, I guess that's what we're discovering and um, profiling the types of requests we're receiving and finding the right person to respond to them. But we are leveraging existing support models at the moment. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take Chair's prerogative and ask another question, given there's none in the, in the chat. Um, uh, Tracy, once again, I think you mentioned the work that had been done to support NCMAS applications. So there was some training that was developed and some example applications. Uh, any feedback on how successful that was? Did that help folks actually write applications for this year's NCMAS program? Um, we know of a few researchers who have applied for NCMAS using those resources themselves. Um, so I guess we'll see <laughs> uh, what the outcome is. Uh, the video um, that we put up to help these researchers is widely available. It's on YouTube. Um, I can see there are lots of views on it. Um, unfortunately, I don't know who those people are. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we'll see how many bioinformatics applications get through next year, I guess. And it'd be, it'd be improper to lean on Dale while he's here to say, let's make sure lots get through. Won't it? <laughs> and on that note, I, I just want to thank you all again for your excellent presentations this afternoon and a really engaging chat and a virtual clap from the audience and I'll hand back to Christina. Thank you all.